also endings. We all, we all know about them, and a lot of people like to complain about them, especially when it comes to TV shows for some reason. Like, rarely will a TV show end in a way where people don't whine about it. I, I don't know why that is, but, you know, endings are kind of hard to get right. I'll admit that, whether we're talking books, movies, anything else. And even when it's bad, usually that doesn't bother me. Because usually, even when it's bad, it doesn't really affect the journey that we took to get there, you know? I enjoyed everything that I read up until that point, and then it's like, oh, the finish line, they kind of stumbled, but eh, whatever, that, that doesn't change it too much. But that's not always the case. Sometimes, sometimes, the ending of something is so bad that it actually does negatively affect everything that came before it. Sometimes it's so bad that it actually is really annoying, you know? It's not just the bad guys lose and the good guys win. It's something really stupid or something that contradicts things that came earlier or just a million little things that could go wrong. And so today I'm here to talk about the 10 worst endings to books I have ever come across in my life. Now, a uh, quick, quick explanation, these are endings to series or endings to standalone books. Like, so I'm not going to be talking about how, oh, the ending of Order of the Phoenix was really bad. Like, that's not going to be on this list because the ending of Order of the Phoenix is not the end of the Harry Potter saga, you know? It, like, there's still more after that, so it's not really the ending. Anyways, uh, I think you get the point of these top ten lists by now. Let's, uh, let, let's get going. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. Starting off at number ten, we have Fallen. So, I already did a whole long, long review of this book series, and if you've seen that, you should probably remember why the ending was bad. So, the basic concept is that we have this main girl, Lucinda, who is cursed with reincarnation and she's in love with an angel. So basically, once every 17 years, she will be born, grow up, meet Daniel, the angel's name, and then she'll die horribly and they, they can never be together and the cycle starts over again. You know, that's, that's their curse. They were cursed by God himself to be in this situation. And in the final book, you learn that it was because uh, during the conflict between God and Lucifer, they refused to take sides. You know, they said, you know, we love each other. We're not going to get into a fight with you guys. We're just, we're staying away from that. Also, because Lucinda is secretly an angel, which was, that was dumb as well, but we're not, <laughs> we're not going to get into that. And so they finally get to the climactic end thing where, like, Lucifer's about to destroy the world, and Lucinda goes up to him, and she's like, hey, you shouldn't destroy the world. And he's like, no, I'm going to. And she's like, no, you shouldn't. You can't. And... Like, they can't fight him or stop him anyway. And then God just comes out of nowhere and he's like, All right, I saved the day. I stopped Lucifer from destroying the world. And then he looks at Luce and Daniel and he's like, Okay, you, you've had a couple thousand years to decide. Like, who are you going to side with? And again, they say, We're not siding with either of you. We're, we're, we love each other too much. And so in addition to just being an absolute... It's like someone heard deus ex machina and thought it was a compliment. It's it's not. Like, God himself literally comes out and just, boom, okay, I saved the day. So it makes all of their all of their suffering and all of their uh, work up until that point seem really pointless. And then they still don't choose any sides, but they still get a happy ending because God says, okay, you know what, fine, I will take away your immortality from both of you and you can be reborn and meet each other one last time, but you're gonna live and die just like humans, and Lucinda and Daniel are like, okay, that's fine. And then the epilogue is just them 17 years later when they first meet, and all their angel friends are watching them going, you know what, I'm glad they finally got to do this. And the thing is, I think the epilogue is cute. I think at least the idea of them losing immortality but getting to finally reincarnate and be together, because that's all they've ever wanted, I think that's a cute idea. In fact, I would say this would, would be a cute ending if they had to work for it in any way. And that's the thing that it really comes to. They didn't have to work for this, and so it feels unsatisfying when they finally get it. And the thing is, there is a spin-off book which actually takes place after the final Fallen book, or final Fallen book, uh, and it's about a different character. And I'm not going to get into the whole plot of that one, but it ends with a whole bunch of demons deciding, hey, we're going to overthrow Lucifer now, let's go do that. 
And he's like, okay, sure, I hate Lucifer. He tried to kill me and my girlfriend. Let's, let's go do that. And just that that's the end. It, it doesn't end with them overthrowing him and saying, yeah, the, the day is saved now. No, it says, let's go overthrow him. And that's the end, which is just a giant middle finger to anyone who cared. All right, I'm cheating a little bit with number nine, but I gotta say it, it is A Song of Ice and Fire. And, okay, the thing is, I'm not talking about the ending of the show here. Uh, whatever your thoughts on that, it is... It's the show. It's different from the books because uh, the final two books have not been written yet. We're, we're never going to get an ending. Like, if you... It's been ten years. If you think that The Winds of Winter is ever going to come out at this point, then I, I wish I had the same kind of hope and belief that, that you do, but it's just not going to happen. And even if it somehow does, we aren't going to have another 15 or 16 years for George R. R. Martin to write A Dream of Spring. Like, it's... It's just not ever going to happen. We're never going to find out exactly uh, how things were going to wrap up. And granted, the show ended, at least in broad strokes, the same way that the books were planned on ending. You know, I'm sure that in the book's ending, if it ever came, we would still get uh, Daenerys finally uh, succumbing to her tyrannical tendencies and killing a bunch of innocent people, and then someone would have to kill her to save the day. And I'm sure we would most likely still end with Bran uh, as King of Westeros. Maybe not necessarily Bran, but, you know, someone who was, you know, elected, as it were, and they would probably still set up a system where they decide, okay, you know what, we're not gonna have a hereditary monarchy anymore, we're gonna have an elected one, which is an improvement on things. Uh, but we'll never know for certain, you know, like, the fine details, we'll, we'll never get to see those, you know, we'll never find out uh, if John actually survives the assassination attempt at the wall, or if he's brought back the way he was in the show, we'll never we'll never find that out. Uh, we'll never see Ramsay Bolton get his comeuppance. We will never uh, find out what's going on with Lady Stoneheart, which I'm actually okay with because I think that's a dumb plot point. It, people complain about her not being in the show, but I'm just like, well, what what was the point of her being in the books? You know, it, if anything, it detracts from the Red Wedding. But you know, that's. That's not the point. Basically, we're never gonna learn about any of these hanging plot threads. We're never gonna find out what happens to the characters we like, or what happens in this world that we're into. And, uh, that just kind of sucks, you know? So, this one's cheating a bit, but yeah, the fact that we're never gonna get an ending to this makes it a bad ending. Number eight is one that I've talked about in the past. It is Island in the Sea of Time. Now this one, the plot to this one is... At the time I read it, it was unique to me. I didn't realize that there were actually a lot that have a similar idea, but it's basically uh, the island of Nantucket in Massachusetts undergoes some sort of weird mass time travel event, so the whole island and its population gets sent back in time to 1250 BCE, which is right in the middle of the Bronze Age, and then with all their new technology and everything, they have to just stop and say, okay, let's survive now. But uh, the big thing is that one of their own... Uh, goes off on his own and decides he wants to conquer stuff. He wants to be a ruler, so he forms his own empire in Greece. Well, it's centered in Greece, but it does expand out into other places. And one day those two things are going to have to fight each other, and that's mostly what the second and third books in the series are about. And the war up until near the end is pretty satisfying, but then at the end, uh, the bad guy just gets poisoned by some of his underlings. You know, him and most of his lieutenants all get poisoned. So his empire falls apart, and the good guys win the war, and that that's kind of it. So it, it's, it's just a really quick, unsatisfying ending where we don't get much of a climax, you know? We don't have any sort of climactic battle or climactic uh, political maneuver which forces him into a corner and he can no longer uh, fight, he has to surrender. Uh, it doesn't uh, force him out of power or anything like that. It's just, hey suddenly these people who were barely mentioned earlier are gonna be on the good guy's side and then they bam they kill the bad guy for you everything's good now let's let's get on to farming and shit i guess i don't know and that's bad enough but the real reason it's on this list is that it can't really commit see the thing is it has it feels like it wants to be a solid ending there but then it also sprinkles in a bunch of little cliffhangers that make it feel like, oh, okay, they were planning on making sequels after this. And so it can't commit. Like, it has uh, one of the bad guy's daughters go off with some of his final loyalists far away into 
the Eurasian steppe, I believe, is where they were originally headed. And it's implied, like, okay, they're going to build up a new kingdom, and then they're going to come back and fight people. Uh, and then there's also uh, this one guy who kind of went off on his own down into Nubia, and he's building his own kingdom there. And specifically, he's doing it because uh, he wants to make sure that black people don't get, like, colonized and enslaved and stuff the way they often were in the real world, which is kind of an admirable goal, I suppose, but they don't really focus on that storyline. I think he gets literally one chapter where we see him going around building stuff, and then he's barely even mentioned after that, which is unsatisfying. And there's two or three more just like that. It's like all these little ideas, which like could have been good for sequels, but we're never exploring them. And so this this book just couldn't commit. It couldn't decide if it even wanted to be an ending or not. And so for that reason, it's one of the worst I've ever come across. Number seven, This Is Why I Hate You by Onision. So if you're familiar with Onision's books, this shouldn't surprise you. Like the first one, Stones to Abigail, is the best one. It's still terrible. Uh, but it's all about, you know, just a regular kid who is in school and then goes around and he does stuff and there's a school shooting and he makes friends. It's it's not good, okay, by any means. It's it's not a good book. It's terrible. But then we run into This Is Why I Hate You, which is just about, I, I don't know, it's a, a violent teenager with daddy issues who joins the Air Force. And then there's even less of a plot in this one. Like, he, he gets two girlfriends and they enter into a polyamorous relationship and then he is also going around being super violent while in the air force and still avoiding getting in trouble for it like he's gouging out people's eyes and breaking ankles for really no reason dude's a crazy psycho absolute psycho uh and so when we get to the end it's not like there's any build-up to a climax or anything but he still tried to greg still tried to make a climax and uh it's okay so basically he gouges out a guy's eye, the guy's mad at him, so he lures Greg away, and then him and some of his friends break into the apartment where his girlfriends are, and then they're about to rape them as revenge for Greg doing stuff. And then Greg comes in, and he gets angry, and he kills them all, but at the last second, the last one kills him. And then the final chapter is one of his girlfriends saying how she finished off his journal, which is not a thing that human beings do. Like, that's that's just a shitty, weird writing trick to begin with. I'm not sure why he thought that was a good idea, but okay. And then they also explain how, oh, Greg was just such a good person. He was so amazing. It's so terrible that people couldn't see how good he was because he was just the best. I loved the way he was a narcissist who violently attacked any, anyone who mildly inconvenienced him. And then also it's revealed that his dad molested him as a child, so it gives him an excuse for being a terrible person, but at the same time he didn't remember his dad molesting him as a child, so it doesn't actually make sense that he did. Look, there's a lot of problems here, and the fact that Greg is clearly just making up this bizarre scenario where this clearly terrible person gets to be the hero and be the good guy, and he gets to point at him and say, ha, look at that, everyone. You see, you thought he was terrible, but he was actually a good guy all along. He's better than all of you. And it's clear that he's just trying to insert himself into the story because Onision's a fucking narcissist, but uh, it's a, that's a, oof, that, that's a whole can of worms I don't want to get into. But, and it's just using rape and molesting of children as a plot device, and he's not doing it well, which is just... I don't know, the whole thing leaves a nasty taste in my mouth, and as I said, this book doesn't really have anything of a story, so this climax to it was immensely unsatisfying, and that's, uh, that's about it. You know, this is why I hate you is terrible. Number six, Twilight. So, it's been quite a long time now, so I think most of us are familiar with the ending of the Breaking Dawn movie. Like, there's that whole big final battle, between the vampires and the other vampires and some werewolves are there and it's actually a cool moment weirdly enough it's like one of the only moments in twilight where everything is really cool you know people are getting their heads ripped off people are getting set on fire it's it's neat uh but then it's revealed that oh it was a vision of the future like this is what happened if you will fight us 
so don't do it. And then the bad guys are just like, okay, and then they leave. So that's unsatisfying, and I don't like the ending of the movie, but I think the ending of the book is worse in a weird way, because at least in the movie, we got that little uh, bit of something before it got taken away from us. In the books, it is the bad guys, the Volturi, want to come in, and they're planning on killing Bella and her whole family because they think that they created a vampire child, which is a no-no because vampire children tend to cause a lot of chaos. It's a, it's a whole thing. Uh, and they know that, oh no, it's not a vampire child. She's actually a half vampire. And so they bring in a bunch of allies and everything that they can use to fight if they have to, but also just as witnesses so that they can see, oh, okay, this isn't a vampire child. And then, you know, the Volturi come in with their whole force, and keep in mind, the Volturi are kind of, sort of, tyrants. You know, they, they've been ruling over the vampire underworld for thousands of years, and they can and they do kill people all the time over it. Uh, and then, so this climax is basically a glorified courtroom scene, where they're like, okay, I think this is a vampire child. It's not, actually. Here's our evidence. Well, I still think she is. Well, it's not. Here's more evidence. I still think. Here's more evidence. And it's just this kind of obnoxious back and forth. And then it gets to the point where the battle starts in the movie, but in the books it's just like, okay, we'll leave now. And the thing is, this is like their one chance to defeat the Volturi. You know, it's, it's hinted at and built up that they are going to have to deal with them at some point in the earlier books and so I was reading this thinking okay this is it this is it here we go but we never get anything and you know this is their this is their one real chance with all their allies here and everything that they could do something but they they don't because Bella and them just don't care about this if it doesn't affect them personally you know and until it affects them and their family they aren't gonna try and save the world which makes them all seem like a bunch of cunts uh, yeah, no, that's about it. It makes them all seem like a bunch of cunts, and the thing is, Twilight is just a story about a girl meeting a vampire, falling in love, becoming a vampire, and then living happily ever after. I get that. But for a little while, this book pretended to be something else. You know, it pretended to be something like, okay, we're gonna have an actual battle with some stakes, and people will have to make sacrifices, and they'll have to work to earn their happy ending, but in the end, we didn't actually get that. So it was pretending to be something it wasn't, and then it pulls the rug right out from under us. And so, for that reason, even though I think that, like, the Twilight books, they're, they're bad, don't get me wrong. I don't think they're good by most metrics, but I also generally think that people who say, like, they're the worst things ever, it destroyed civilization, it melted my brain, that that's kind of stupid, because they're not really that bad. But when we get to the ending of this, like, Yes, this is one of the worst endings I've ever come across, and I will fully agree with you guys that at least this part of the books is mind-meltingly awful. Number five is one that I have talked about before. It is House of Night. The thing about House of Night is that while I spent... <laughs> I think the video is almost two hours long, and I spent that whole time talking about the series, but I kind of glossed over the second half of the series. Because... Well, partially because it would have gotten a little repetitive to go over every detail, but also partially because I was just tired and I wanted to be done with things. And if I describe, like, in broad strokes, the ending, it might sound passable. You know, it's basically just the villain, Neferet is her name, uh, finally attacks with, like, an undead army and shit, and she's gonna destroy Tulsa, Oklahoma, and then she's gonna go on and conquer the whole world, and it's gonna be, it's gonna be terrible and all that stuff. And then the heroes have to work together. They have to fight, excuse me, they have to fight off all her minions, and then they fight Neferet herself, and eventually they defeat her. And the, a couple of them die along the way, but, you know, they died fighting for a good cause, and they really had to work at it, so it, it sounds fine. It sounds like a pretty standard good guys win, bad guys lose story, but... For a couple of reasons, it's much worse than it sounds. Like, for starters, the way they defeat Neferet is with a magical circle, which is where, you know, they all come together and link their powers, and then using those powers they can do stuff that's, that they couldn't do individually. And the thing is that almost every book in the series ends with them 
using some sort of magic circle to cast some sort of spell to defeat the bad guys. It's only temporary in most of them, but in this one it's just permanent. So, and keep in mind, there are 12 books in this series. It's not like they did this two or three times before, and now it's just getting a little repetitive. No, they've done it like 10 times. Like 10 of the books end in basically this exact same way up until this point. And then, so it's just unsatisfying to see the same thing done over and over and over and over. And the second big reason is that after... Oh man, how, I'm trying to think of a way to explain this without getting into all of the weird details about this series, but basically, after they defeat the villain, they get rewarded, and the reward for the main character, Zoe, is that she gets to be the head of the House of Night in Tulsa, and one of her friends gets to be head of the other House of Night, which is in the sewers. I'm not explaining that, it would take too long. Now, number one, Zoe is really, really young, so it's kind of stupid that she's in charge here, and honestly, Zoe is the ultimate Mary Sue, you know, like, it's been, up until this point, she's been, like, touched by the vampire goddess, she's gotten to speak personally with the vampire goddess, all of the boys are in love with her and making the kissy on her, uh, she has, like, super special magic powers that no one else has, uh, the vampire queen has decided that she will, uh, become queen after she dies, like, all of this is really, really stupid and just... It's, it's dumb. I hate seeing Mary Sue's get everything they want, but it also, weirdly enough, her becoming the head of the House of Night feels like a small reward for everything. Like, you know, if they had, you know, saved the whole world and then Zoe became Vampire Queen, it would still be really dumb, but at least it would fit with the tone of the rest of this. But instead, she's just the head of this one House of Night. It's like if you saved the world and everyone said, congratulations, now you get to be a city council member in Duluth, Minnesota. It, it's like, it, it feels weird because, yeah, I'll admit, in this series, the characters did have to, you know, work and struggle and sacrifice to get their happy ending, but their happy ending then feels weirdly anticlimactic, I suppose? Like, their, their reward is just so small, so it feels... Dumb. It feels even dumber than the rest of the series does, and that's kind of impressive. And then the third reason is much smaller, but it's basically just... Zoe has this one... one of the dudes who is in her orbit and who she constantly treats like shit throughout the entire series. He dies earlier on, and then he gets brought back in the new body, and then he dies again in this. And it's treated as like, well, it sucks that he died, but he sacrificed himself for a good cause. And it just annoys me, because Zoe has done so many terrible things to him over the course of this, and he he never gets his happy ending. So, yeah, basically, all of that together, it's very unsatisfying, very anticlimactic, it's stupid, and I, I don't know, it's, it's difficult to explain all the ways in which I hate House of Night without going into all the small details, and we'd be here for hours. So, yeah, this one, even though it has some aspects which could be worse, it deserves to be in the bottom half of this list. Number four, The Young World. So, okay, I've talked about this one before. And the premise sounds fine, and I think the first book is actually really good. Or, not really good, but it's, it's enjoyable enough. B basically, there was this pandemic outbreak, disease, whatever you want to call it, that went around and it killed all of the adults and it killed all the young children. The only people that survived were people that were in puberty, so basically from the ages of like eh, 12 or 13 to around the ages of 18. And the thing is, they, they still die after they exit puberty. So not long after they turn 18 and their hormones start uh, decreasing, uh, the virus hits them and they die. And so it seems like, oh, the world is going to end, we're all fucked. But there is this one person in New York who thinks that they know how to get a cure, so they decide to go on a journey to see if they can do that. And the first book is just about that, and it's enjoyable enough. It has issues, but eh, I liked it. But then the second book comes around and it's revealed that only the Americas got hit by the virus. North and South America. They're the only ones that got hit by it and everyone there died except for the kids. The rest of the world is still chugging along, doing its thing, and they think everybody there died. And well, that that's stupid enough on its own. But then the heroes like go back to New York 
and because they do manage to find a cure. Ba basically, uh, you just need some of the blood from main character dude, and then as he gives it to people, they get cured, and then their blood also works as a cure, and y you know, you, you can pass it on, basically. And they, they get there, and then there's also, like, a nuclear weapon firing thing, which another bad guy gets his hands on, and he threatens to shoot it, and then they uh, manage to defeat him, and it's, I mean, the climax is kind of cool, I suppose, but then it turns out that the rebel guys who helped them get into New York and helped them find the cure in the first place actually released the virus in the rest of the world, so a whole lot of people are gonna die, but it's treated like, oh, that's okay, we'll just give them the cure. Yeah, but uh, they, they won't be able to just kill us all and take over this territory. They, they need us, they need our blood and all that. Okay, um, here's the thing. I found myself rooting for the authoritarian governments that were trying to kill all the kids in North and South America so that they could recolonize without anybody getting infected. I, I was on their side in this because the thing is, it, if you release that disease and it infects a whole bunch of people, people are going to die. There's no way you can get the cure to all of them in time. Like, you can just look at the COVID vaccine rollout for proof of that. Like, there's places that have handled it badly, places that have handled it pretty well, and but nowhere has done it perfectly. There's nowhere where everybody has gotten vaccinated. And so, even if this cure works in 100% of cases, it's not going to get to everybody in time. There's no way you could get it to the whole world in time. So basically, the good guys went off and killed millions more people, possibly billions of people, and were supposed to cheer for them. Like, oh, they stopped the other bad guy from launching the nukes. Like, okay, that saved some lives, but then you killed all these people, so I think it kind of balances out. You know, you're, you're all terrible people, and I hate you. So <laughs> while this ending is in many ways done well. You know, it does have like an, an actual climax which is built up to and there's some fun action there and yada yada. But despite all of that, I hate the ending because it makes me want, it, it tries to make me side with some of the most horrible people in human history. Number three is the fifth wave. So this is another one I've talked about at length. I, I, I don't know, man. It's just, it starts off good. You know, it starts off as aliens come and attack the world, vast majority of the human population dies, uh, main character girl gets separated from her younger brother, so she decides to set off and go find him. That sounds pretty good, and it's focused enough that the beginning of this story works well. You know, it, it is actually a pretty solid opener. But then, once they're reunited, they don't have any grand plans after that. They aren't going, okay, let's kill all the aliens. They aren't thinking, let's save the world. They're just thinking, let's stay away from these guys and survive. Which makes the whole series feel kind of aimless for a long time. Uh, and then we get to the last book, and it's just kind of brought to our attention that, hey, aliens are going to drop bombs on a bunch of s the remaining cities all over the world, and they're going to kill most of the remaining human population. Not all of them, but most of them. Why are they doing this? I don't know. We never actually get a solid reason for why the aliens are doing what they do nor do we ever directly interact with the aliens. All we interact with are their proxies on Earth. Uh, okay. And then they go through this whole rigmarole, and main character girl accidentally downloads like 10,000 other mem uh, personalities into her head, so she has all these other people which start blending with her, and she's like, whoa, this is crazy. Okay, I gotta go save the day now, because all of a sudden she wants to save the day. That That's just what she does. And then she grabs a bomb, goes up to the alien ship, and before they get the chance to launch their load on Earth, she blows it up and destroys everything there, and so all the aliens are gone, and then the few remaining humans can rebuild. Uh, okay, that just comes completely out of nowhere, is the main thing. This was not built up towards, you know, the main character's girl, goal, none of the main character's goal, was to save the world. They were just trying to survive, so <clears throat> them suddenly deciding that they want to save the world feels out of place, it feels out of character, and I, I don't know, it's, it's just odd. And then we get the real main character girl, Cassie. I mentioned in my review of it that sh I don't think she's a Mary Sue. She has elements of being a Mary Sue, but she, she skirts the line sometimes, but she never crosses that line. And the fact that she has to nobly sacrifice herself at the end of the story 
definitely puts a lot of uh, credence to Mary Sue idea. Like, I still don't think she is one, but yeah, having your main character die or sacrifice themselves at the end of a story, that's a delicate line to walk, because if you do it wrong, then it just makes it feel like, oh, everyone misses them because they were so good. They, they gave up everything for the rest of us because they were just such good, cool guys. It's like, it's like the ending of This Is Why I Hate You all over again. You know what I mean? And so it comes out of nowhere. Uh, the main characters don't really have to work that hard for it. Um, admittedly, they do sacrifice some things, like a couple of people die along the way, but uh, I don't remember any of their names, so who gives a shit? And then Cassie, main character girl, also dies, but I mean, I wasn't that attached to her, and I kind of went over the whole uh, Mary Sue thing. I don't, I don't know. I could probably sit here and talk about that a, a lot longer, but I just... I don't want to. Man, this this was a terrible ending for a couple of reasons, and it just felt really unsatisfying because looking back at it, I can see places where this series could have uh, made a different turn or did something slightly differently, and it would have been better. It wouldn't have been great necessarily, I don't think, but it would have been better, and it could have led to a better ending, or even an ending that's very similar to this one, and it would have just felt more satisfying, but it didn't. It was very unsatisfying, and I'm honestly kind of surprised I even remember it, because it just feels so bleh. Number two, Everworld. So this is another one where it's basically no ending. See, this was written by K.A. Applegate, who also wrote the uh, Animorphs books. And these were basically about some kids who got transported to this place called Everworld, which was basically a place where all the legends and mythologies of Earth exist uh, simultaneously. So we have Egyptian gods, Norse gods, etc. Uh, but then there's also this guy called Ka Anor, who has recently entered it from a different dimension altogether, and he's the eater of gods, and the other gods fear him because he can, well, he can eat them. And so that's actually why they brought the kids into the world. They were they brought uh, one of them, Senna, on purpose, but then the others just kind of got caught up in it. And most of the series is just them tracking down Senna and trying to find a way for them to uh, go back home. And it, it's good up until... Well, really, it's good all the way through up until, like, the last two pages of the last book because the second to last book, they actually kill Senna. Like, she brings in more people from Earth who are supposed to be like her personal army, but uh, they, they kill her and so they're suddenly leaderless. And then they decide in the last book, like, okay, we have the Senites who are going around causing trouble and we have Ka'anor who's gonna come in and fuck shit up if we don't unite everybody. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna build up an alliance of gods and others and just bring everyone together and hopefully we can defeat this great evil. And they, by this point, they accept that, like, yeah, they're never going home. And so the last book is mostly about them trying to rescue Thor and Baldur, who are imprisoned in the underworld. And then they go down there, and as I'm reading this, I was thinking, wow, they're going to wrap all this up in 50 pages. That's crazy. They're going to wrap all this up in 20 pages. That's crazy. And then it ends with them rescuing Thor and Baldur, and they're like, okay, we're going to build our alliance now. And then that's it. That's the end. We never find out what happens next, and man, I do I even need to go into much more detail about that? It's like, it, it's no ending. You know, like, if we had just one more book after this, or maybe two, because they're not that long, uh, we could have had, you know, a final conflict and an actual ending, a satisfying conclusion, but we don't have that. It's just like, yep, uh, use your imagination, I guess, and so... That, it actually made me angry when I first read that, so, uh, yeah, fu fuck it, uh, Everworld's at number two. And number one, the worst ending to a book that I have ever read in my life is Reaper's Creek by Onision. Just like This Is Why I Hate You, if you're familiar with this book, you know exactly, exactly why I hate this. So, the, the, the premise of this one is basically just that there's a kid who starts developing special powers and then discovers that he is a god. And then he goes and does godlike things. And he, like, he fights other gods and stuff. 
And the last... There's, like, no plot to this one whatsoever. It, it has... The, it'll... Uh, oh, man, how do I even go into this? The book will, in little chunks, have separate stories, I suppose, or mostly separate stories that all follow this one same guy. Like, it'll have, oh, okay, he's just a kid in a dysfunctional family. And then it'll have, oh, okay, he's being abused by a pedophile. And then it has, oh, okay, there's dead bodies that keep appearing in a creek behind him. But the last little chunk of the book, like the climax, such as it were, is where he's fully built up all his godlike powers, and then he gets dragged out into space by the spirit of death, and he's like, hey, I'm just a piece of another god, and we are all gonna kill you now. But then the main character, Greg, just sort of snaps his fingers, and that god's dead. Then he tracks down the other god. We never find out how he does this. He just kind of does. And then he basically just snaps his fingers, other guy's dead. And uh, God is also kind of his father, I, I think. It's not explained well. And then he eventually tracks it down to this god of gods named Call, who I, he did bad things because he wanted his daughter back because his daughter was a god, but she's dead now. And it's impossible to bring a dead god back to life. And then Dan Daniel slash Greg, th the character's name in the book is Daniel, but it's clearly just a self-insert for Greg and they actually refer to him as Greg several times in the book. It's it's horrible. Uh, but then, yeah, Greg just sort of snaps his fingers, and cool, the other god is back, and the other god is also his mom somehow, and she never gets a name, which is dumb. Now, in addition to this just being the easiest, most unsatisfying conclusion of all time, like somehow worse than Fallen, it, uh, it, it gets kind of worse, because Greg and his mother like, remake the world in their image, and it's their idea of, like, a utopia, but they just straight up destroy all cultures and artworks and everything that they find pointless or that they think are bad. So they're, they're kind of ruling over the earth with an iron fist. It's a tyrannical regime. It's treated as a good thing, but but... It's not. Like, you don't even really need to read between the lines that much. You just have to read exactly what's going on and think, whoa, this is... this sounds horrible. Why would anyone like this? Because, well, Greg's ideal world is one where he gets to rule over other people like a god. And on top of that, all of the other little chunks throughout the book, all the other little storylines, such as it were, individually they all sound kind of okay, at least as a premise. Obviously, you would have to have someone other than Onision write them because they're he's he's not a good writer at, by any stretch but the thing is they all sound at least kind of fine on the surface but then once they, they none of them have a good conclusion either you know it's not like here's a short story with its own beginning middle end and then here's another one with its own beginning middle end it's just sort of here's something with a beginning and a middle and then we'll just kind of forget about it and then here's something else with a beginning and a middle and then we'll forget about it so like we have a plot line where main character lives in a dysfunctional family and he tries to escape that by uh, entering a, an inappropriate relationship with an older girl and that just never really gets concluded. It's just, it's treated as though they have some real romance even though she's an actual fucking pedophile. At the end it's like, okay, we're together now and we're gonna have kids and stuff and that's just gross. And then there's another plot line where it's like, oh, dead bodies keep appearing in the creek behind my house. I, I wonder what's going on with that. And it never really gets a satisfying conclusion. That's like, oh, I keep getting abducted by aliens every night. By the way, if you haven't read the book, I know that seems like I'm just putting that in and it feels very out of place. It feels pretty out of place when you read it too. Uh, but yeah, the alien plotline doesn't get a real satisfying conclusion. He just goes to their planet as a god and he's like, hey, be nice to me, bro, or I'll kill you. And so all, it's like multiple um, crappy endings or just no endings all squeezed into one tiny book. This is not a long book either. It's like, I mean, most copies when he sells them are like 190 pages, but they're all double spaced. So less than 100 pages really is what the, this should be. And so it's barely a novella is what I'm getting at. And, uh, I don't know, what, what else do I even need to say? It's like another book that tries to get me to side with someone who's clearly the bad guy and who's a 
crazy narcissist, but then it, he's he's not, so it's not a satisfying ending. It's not like a fun, action-packed ending, because none of this was built up to, and the climax is not fun or satisfying in any way. I, I don't know, man, just... Reaper's Creek is the worst book, I, or the worst ending to a book I've ever read. I wouldn't call it the worst book I've ever read just because it is funny going through it, and also because I kind of knew what I was getting into when I read it, but that's, I don't know, that's, that's a whole thing. But, yeah, it's, it's a terrible ending. If you can think of a book that has, or a book series that has a worse ending than this, I, I kind of doubt it exists, but I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on that, and that's... I don't know, that's all. Take care. Bye. Special thanks to all the names you see here. These are all my patrons, and especially thanks to my $10 and up patrons, Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rand, Brother Santodis, Carolina Clay, Christopher Quinten, Echo, Great Grebo, Joel, Karkat Kitsune, K.R. Stevenson, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Madison Lewis Bennett, Microphone, Moritz Fux, Sad Mardigan, Samuel Nevin, Tobacco Crow, Tom Beanie, and Vavictus. As well as, you know, everyone who's watched this far. If you want to get your name on here or get access to stuff like early access to my videos and voting on what topic I'll cover next, then consider becoming a patron. If you don't want to do that, then you could also just subscribe and like this video and share it around or become a YouTube channel member. Really, there's a lot of things you could be doing to make my life better. And that's really what this is all about. It's all about what you can do for me. So uh, get on that. Bye.